Sidetrack Episode 4, The Plague of Cyprian and the Growth of Christianity Out of the blue came this disease, a thing more frightful than any disaster whatever, Dionysius of Alexandria. Welcome back to the History of the Papacy podcast. I am, as always, Steve, your host for this podcast about the history of the Popes of Rome. This is an installment of our Sidetrack episodes, where we take a closer look at some fascinating characters, events, and really anything else that is interesting, but somewhat tangential to the direct story of the Popes of Rome we explore in the main episodes. The opening quote by Dionysius, Bishop of Alexandria, really says it all. In the past, plagues and pestilence just seemed to come out of nowhere. Things would seemingly be fine one day, and then the next day people begin to die where they stood. It is absolutely mind-boggling for me, growing up and living in a time and place where epidemic disease is almost unheard of, to imagine a time where 30 or even 50% of my friends, family, and neighbors could be dead within a few years' time. Everyone has heard stories at family reunions or around the fire about the Spanish influenza, grandparents who had the measles or mumps, or of a great uncle or aunt who had polio or died from an infectious disease. For many of us, though, who are Generation Xers, Yers, or Millennials, especially in the developed world, all of this is pretty much ancient history. We have a well-rounded diet, access to clean water, and adequate sanitation. Not to say if we do get sick, we have state-of-the-art medical knowledge, medication, and an understanding of immunology. Unfortunately, not everyone today has access to all of these things, but even when an epidemic does break out today, there are people and agencies available to offer assistance. I used a few sources when researching this topic. One was right from the horse's mouth, which was Cyprian of Carthage. He wrote a text called On the Mortality, which described the plague in first person. A second source is a book I have mentioned before called The Rise of Christianity by Rodney Stark. The Rise of Christianity has a chapter dedicated to the plague of Cyprian, specifically how the Christian movement reacted to the plague, and how the plague affected the Christian movement's growth. Also, just as a caveat, I am not a medical professional, so I will only speak about the medical issues in the broadest way. If you have anything to add, or if I made any egregious mistakes, please let me know by email, the Facebook group, the website, etc. Transport yourself back, oh, 1700 years ago or so to the Roman Empire, And you will see none of the above-mentioned amenities are really available. Clean water, proper sanitation, and a balanced diet were available for the wealthy and some others, but for the lower classes, much of these amenities were not even close to accessible. In the rural areas, many people were subsistent farmers or worked on the great estates. In the city, people were jam-packed into terrible housing, dirty streets, or in other words, the perfect place for the spread of infectious disease. Historians and scientists aren't exactly sure what hit the Roman world in 250 AD. The two prime suspects are smallpox and measles. Both diseases cause similar symptoms with the symptoms in the plague of Cyprian. This is an unfortunate name for the plague, You get the impression that either Cyprian or the Christians were the ones who were spreading this deadly disease. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, was simply the first person to document the pandemic that broke loose in the early 250s AD. So he gets the honor of having the plague named after him. If you were to catch measles or smallpox, what are your chances of surviving? If you live today, they are pretty good. First off, if you are vaccinated, your chances of getting one of these diseases are virtually zero. If you are not vaccinated, you still have a low chance for death. Back in 250 AD, there was no medication that could cure smallpox or measles, and for that matter, 
There isn't a pill or course of medicinal treatment for either of these diseases today. Smallpox and measles are viruses which are not treatable with antibiotics. So back in the 3rd century AD, if you were lucky enough to have a decent diet, you would have a stronger immune system, and that was about all you could do to prevent one of these diseases. If someone contracted one of these diseases, the only thing one could really do is treat the symptoms. Nowadays, someone would get medicines, usually over-the-counter types like ibuprofen or acetaminophen to lower fever. You'd make sure the person is well hydrated and comfortable. Those simple treatments can, in a great way, reduce the mortality rate of measles or smallpox. The quote from the beginning of the episode by Dionysius of Alexandria says it all. The plague just seemed to drop onto the scene out of the clear blue sky. It is possible that either of these measles or mumps were new afflictions or were in a modified, evolved form, so people didn't have any immunities to these diseases either. So one day, people just started to die. They would break out in horrible blisters all over their bodies. They would die, and then other members of their household or neighbors and friends would all start to get the same symptoms. Measles and smallpox are both airborne diseases, so these diseases would have spread very quickly through the densely populated urban areas of the empire. Cyprian of Carthage wrote a long treatise on the plague called On the Mortality, which gives a short description of the symptoms of the disease. The main focus of On the Mortality is not an eyewitness reporting of the epidemic, but more of a sermon on how bad things happen all the time. There are famines, wars, persecutions, and plagues. Cyprian goes on to say that the end times spoken of in the scriptures, of which he quotes in length, must be coming very soon because of all the terrible things that are happening. It probably wasn't much of a stretch to think that the end of the world was nigh. The empire was in a constant state of warfare. There were crop failures. The Decian persecution was in full swing, and then a devastating plague hits completely out of the blue, which is killing somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of the population. The 50% fatality rate is on the very high range of the estimates given by scholars, but it isn't outside of the realm of possibilities that localized numbers could have been that high. Who can really blame Cyprian for thinking a revelation of St. John, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse-style end of days wasn't happening? By Cyprian's estimation, though, this wasn't a bad thing. If the end of days was coming... That meant the second coming was also just around the corner. Even if the second coming of Christ wasn't happening, what's the big deal of dying anyways? If you die, you go to a place of refreshment, get to live with Abraham, the saints, Jesus, and all of your previously departed friends and family. You know, heaven. Where is the downside with that, Cyprian would say? Just don't lose your faith and everything else will work itself out. The writings of Dionysius of Alexandria and Cyprian of Carthage are really upbeat and positive. This was not the case with the pagans, though. Just keep in mind, much of what we know about the pagan response to the plague is based on the writings of Christian writers. So, well, take that with a grain of salt. Generally, the pagans viewed everything that was going on as the end of the world, too, except in a bad way. This is a major theme and may have been one reason why Christianity came out in a stronger position after the plague. Dionysius of Alexandria said that the pagans would throw a sick family member out of the house, they would not treat an afflicted person, and wouldn't even bury their dead, but instead leave them out in the street. Here's a quote from Dionysius of Alexandria. Quote, At the first onset of the disease, they, the pagans that is, pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, throwing them onto the roads before they were dead and treated unburied corpses as dirt, hoping thereby to avert the spread and contagion of the fatal disease. But do what they might, they found it difficult to escape. End quote. The Christians, on the other hand, were encouraged to nurse and minister to the sick. 
I can see some out there rolling their eyes and saying this is just after the fact Christian claptrap bashing the pagans. But even pagan writers noticed that these early Christians were exercising much more charity during this plague than the pagan religions were. About a hundred years later, the emperor Julian, Julian the Apostate that is, tried to reform the pagan religions by having them copy Christian charitable acts. He is even quoted as saying that the impious Galileans, that's what he called the Christians, gave charity and help to their own needy and the pagan needy as well. It was a really nice try by Julian, but the horse had really left the barn for paganism at that point and it wasn't coming back. This was a main distinction between paganism and Christianity. At a fundamental level, Christians were called on to be charitable, and if they were not, they seriously risked defending God. As Stark puts it, though, the pagans were under no such obligation. The Greco-Roman deities could care less about charity and all that. All the pagan gods cared about was that the sacrifices were conducted regularly and in a proper manner. As we've seen in previous episodes, not sacrificing really got under the Roman skin. Also, a pagan didn't risk their salvation or afterlife by not helping out another person, as the Christians did. This is where Stark's theory really starts gathering steam. In The Rise of Christianity, he lays out a theoretical situation. First, he states that modern medical experts estimate that treatment of the symptoms of either measles or smallpox could lower the fatality rate by up to two-thirds. So instead of a 30% fatality rate, the Christians may have lowered their rate to as low as 10%. Stark relies heavily on a book by William McNeil called Plagues and Peoples to support his medical claims. I've read some of the book and it is very interesting. Stark takes a theoretical Roman city of 10,000 people pre-plague of 160 AD, known as the Antonine Plague, which was a terrible plague in its own right. He estimates that of the 10,000 inhabitants of Roman City X, about 40 are Christians, or 0.4% Christian, or you could even say it in another way, one Christian for every 249 pagans. Now, post-plague, if the Christians used nursing and experienced only a 10% death rate, while the pagans used no nursing or very limited nursing, would have had a 30% fatality rate. As a result, the population situation would have looked somewhat different at the end of the first round of plague, but not shockingly different. Where it gets interesting is if the Christians were still gaining converts at a constant rate on top of their higher birth rate, the population situation after the Cyprian plague would have looked very different. Keeping all these factors constant, the Christians could have comprised as much as 25% of the population of this town post-plague of Cyprian. Within 100 years, Christians would have gone from less than one-half of 1% of the population of this town to in the 260s AD, a quarter of the population. That kind of demographic shift can't be ignored. Massive shifts in population like this cause huge changes in the whole culture of an area. This effect would have been much more pronounced in the cities than in the rural areas. On top of that, The Christian population that came out of the plague would have had a higher percentage of people who had natural immunity to whatever disease caused the plague. Stark thinks that all of these factors would have definitely made an impact on the pagan population and could have possibly increased conversion rates even higher. He even goes one step further and says that if the empire hadn't been hit by all of these plagues, Christianity may have never had the numbers in absolute nor percentage of the population terms to become the most important religious movement in the empire by the 4th century AD. I hope you have enjoyed this look at the plague of Cyprian and the growth of Christianity.
plague wasn't the only factor in the growth of Christianity, but it is a fascinating episode in the history of the Christian church. If you have any comments or questions, you can get in contact through the Facebook page, History of the Papacy Podcast, the website, a to z history page dot libsyn dot com or email history of the papacy podcast at gmail dot com. Don't forget you can also support the podcast by submitting a review on iTunes. Five star reviews are always welcome, but any feedback is welcome to help make this show a more informative and entertaining experience. Thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to seeing you on our next stop on our trip through the history of the Roman popes.